Good morning, petition. We are on Thursday, week 27. We're going to start with some adding fractions, subtracting fractions, and mixed numbers. So the skill we're really thinking about is equivalent fractions so that we're getting those like units. So notice in A, we have 7 eighths, and we want to subtract 3 fourths. I do not have like units right? My denominators are not the same. But I know there's a relationship between 8 and 4. So I know a good way to get my common denominators, my like units, would be to double 3 into double 4 so that that would get us to our denominator of 8 that we're looking for, right? I'm keeping 7 8 to 7 8, but I'm turning 3 fourths into an equivalent fraction with a denominator of 8. What did I do to the 4? To get to 8, I multiply it by 2. Whatever I do to the denominator, we're going to sink and do the same to the top. So 3 times 2 gives us 6. Notice, boys and girls, 6 eighths equals 3 fourths. We've not changed the value, but we have made it a problem where we have like units. Now, my denominator is going to stay the same because my whole is still divided up into the same number of parts. But now I'm going to think if I have seven eighths and I subtract six eighths, I now have one. So my answer to this question will be seven eighths minus six eighths equals one eighth. Now, in your to small to give yourself enough space to work, I decided I'm going to come over and actually put this on a post-it note. Because I want to make sure that I can make this large enough for you so that we can talk about it and make sure that we really understand it. But obviously, you know what you are doing this, you're going to have to write a small to do it inside that rectangle. Okay? So we are going to use this same strategy of getting to our equivalent fractions, but we're adding in also the fact that we have mixed numbers. So now I don't just have a proper fraction one third plus a proper fraction one fifth. I also have this whole number four and this whole number one stuck to the front. So first of all, what we did in class and what my students really liked was to go ahead and work with those whole numbers. Four plus one gives us five. And then they remembered that we still have this proper fraction that we're going to add to that. And we still have this proper fraction that we're going to add to that, right? So they broke that apart a little bit to turn this into a problem where we have our proper fractions together. We've already taken care. We know we're going to put whole number five to the front of this. Now, three and five are my denominators, so they are not alike. The first thing that I need to do is I need to think about these, and I need to turn them into equivalent fractions with new denominators that are the same. So I'm going to start with my bigger number, 5. And I'm going to think about 5. And really what I'm doing is thinking about the lowest common multiple of 5, right? I'm going to start with 5, and I'm going to skip count by 5. Let's do the first three factors of 5. Or excuse me, not factors, multiples. The first three multiples of 5. Skip counting. I have 5, 10. 15. Obviously, this could go on. In fact, it could go on forever, but I'm going to pause here. And I'm going to ask myself, huh, if I skip counted by three, would I hit any of those numbers? Three, six, nine, 12, 15, 18. Oh, wait, I've already hit one of those numbers. I didn't hit five. I won't hit five when I skip count by three. I didn't hit 10. I won't hit 10 when I skip count by three. But sure enough, I did say five because three times five gives me 15. So I know that that is a good denominator choice, right? But now I have to think, how do I make this into their equivalent form? So I know that one third can equal something over 15, because really what I can do is three times five. Three times five gives me 15. Whatever I do to the denominator, I'm also going to do to the numerator. Here I have 1 times 5 equals 5. So I know 1 third 
and 5 and teens equal the same thing. They would split at the same place on the number line, but I've turned that into a function where now I can get toward like denominators. Okay, we're going to do the opposite here. We're going to multiply by 3, because 5 times 3 gives me 15. Whatever I do to the top, I'll do to the bottom, and vice versa. So 1 times 3 gives me 3, right? Now, I still have this 5 stuck to the front. Don't forget about your whole number. But now, I can actually perform my operation. Because I know that if I have 15 here and 15 here, those like denominators allow me to add the numerators. So 5 plus 3 gives me 8, and I can't forget about that whole number 5. So the answer to this problem is 5 and 8 fifteenths. Okay, so we had one answer here. Another answer on the post-it note. Feel free to pause this and study what we did. But I think we are ready to head down to another question. This one we're going to be thinking about. Um, some division, and it starts with an interesting situation. Algo Rhythm spends five tenths of an hour to hack a computer. How many computers can Algo Rhythm hack in four hours? Write a division equation to solve. Well, what is it that we are? What is it that we are um, dividing up? Right? Is it the five tenths of an hour? Or is it the four hours? One of those quantities is the whole that's going to be broken up, and the other is the portion that we're going to break it into. Right? That's really important as we think about as we think about division, right? The dividend is the whole thing that's getting broken up. What we're going to break up, guys, is this four hours. This large time quantity is going to be broken up, and it's going to be broken up in groups of or portions of five tenths of an hour. So, what is my answer here, or excuse me, what is my divisor here? My divisor is five tenths. Now, remember, five tenths is the same thing as five tenths. So, if you did it as that, you can certainly substitute that. That means the same thing. But when I do that, when I take 4 and I divide it into halves, because 5 over 10, again, means halves, how many halves do I end up with? Well, I end up with 8, right? That's the answer to that problem. We created a division equation, plus we have also given the answer. The answer, of course, is the number of uh, half hours that he has to hack into the computer. Okay, let's go to our next one. Chaining potatoes, potato sacks, each weigh 455 grams. He has 14. How many kilograms do the sacks weigh? We've got a couple different things going on in this problem. You might need to read this one a couple times to make sense of it and zero in on those numbers. Also zero on the form that our answer should take. We're starting with a certain number of grams, and then we're going to take that to a certain number of kilograms. Okay, a couple different things going on in the problem. So the first thing I need to decide is what operation am I really needing to do here to figure out this situation with the potato sacks? I have 14 potato sacks, and they each weigh 455 grams. So potato sack one weighed that, potato sack two weighed that, potato sack three and four and five, all the way up to 14. So this is a multiplication question because we have 455 and we're multiplying that by 14. Yes, you must show your strategy for multiplying here. This is an opportunity to practice multiplying. After you have multiplied this, resume the video and see if your answer and mine agree. The answer to this question will be 6,370 grams, right? So that is the answer that you should have gotten when you did 
five times 14. But now we need to remember that that is going back to the context of grams. And instead, we need our answer to be in kilograms. So the next part of this problem is actually taking this many grams and saying, what does that equal in kilograms? So now, boys and girls, we have to do a metric conversion to actually get this into the form that the answer requires. Kg, kilogram, right? Well, I need to remember the context here, okay? There are 1,000 grams in one kilogram, right? That's why you might remember the staircase. You might think about that staircase. If you think about weight, we died, drink and chocolate milk, you know that we're going to be going up and to the left three stairs. Really, that relates to this power of 10, this 1,000. And if I'm taking it in grams, in kilograms, I'm using a smaller unit to describe the same quantity because this one is a thousand times bigger, right? So really, in essence, what I'm doing is I'm taking this number and I'm dividing it by a thousand. If I divide it by a thousand, just like we've seen even this week as we've done powers of 10 on Tuesday for our very first problem, we know if we're dividing by a thousand, it's really like moving that zero in three times to equate for each of these tens and us becoming 10 times less each time, right? So this is the number in grams. But to convert it to kilograms, we're going to move all three times to the left to equate for really the fact that we're dividing by a thousand. So we go one and two and three, and our decimal should be here when we report it in kilograms. Okay, I'm very proud of us for sticking with this problem. It would be easy just to leave it in grams because yes you've done a lot of work already at that moment but remember mathematicians we've got to really be precise with our answers and with our thinking and make sure that we're following that question to the very end now our next question is going to give us another opportunity to think about the metric conversion system and all of these are metric length because we see the m and the n means meter right that's our base unit in the metric system for length. Okay, bill weights is measuring SB cords. How many centimeters are in each of the cords below? Well, if I have 76 meters and I want to convert that to centimeters, remember boys and girls, one meter has 100 centimeters, right? Those are equal. So I would be taking this and I would be multiplying it by 100. Or if you're thinking about the staircase, you're going down the staircase to the right two times. So you would take this number. Our decimal was here in meters. So we're moving it two times to go to 20 meters. That's where my decimal is, which really means it becomes whole number 76 in centimeters. Now we're going to think about 19 and 32 hundredths meters. This is where my decimal started when it was meters. So to get to centimeters, we're going to move it two times to the right. So look, this becomes a whole number. I'm going to put a comma here because where my pen was really made it look like we have a decimal there. And I don't want that decimal to be there. That's where I was just showing that it started. Remember, boys and girls, that is a whole number. 1,932. Pay special attention to that one. Since again, the pen made that look a little bit off. Maybe I'll go over that even in my, one of my favorite pens, this nice pink color. There we go. That looks a little clearer. All right. How many millimeters are in each cord below? Well, that's going to be a very different thing because look, eight meters. But now I have to equate for the fact that there are 1,000 millimeters in that. If you're thinking about your staircase, you're going down the staircase, three stairs. Down into the right, the decimal moves to the right three times. So we would go one, two, three. Uh oh, there's nothing there to move around. If there's nothing there, we use a placeholder. 
that placeholder is zero, we have a thousand millimeters in meters. Okay, our next one is 56 meters. We're going to move our decimal three times to the right. One, two, three. We're going to plug in those zeros, and we have 56,000 millimeters in 56 meters. All right, let's finish this week strong. Just one more question. And this one more question is, again, requiring us to think with a strategy that you may or may not use as your go-to strategy, but it's good for our brains to take a look at someone else's problem solving and think about that problem solving and then apply it to question I and question double I. So in our example, we see 14 what? 14 hundred times three what? Three tenths. That's why this is recorded as 14 over 100, three over 10. Now, when I multiply 14 times three, that's going to be my new denominator. When I multiply 100 times 10, that's going to be my new denominator. When I carry that out, I get 42 over 1,000, right? So now, boys and girls, we're going to have 5,500 times three tenths, but I can also write that so that hopefully it won't take up too much space where you can see it a little bit better. You know, we're going to come to the side. we got to write this out a little bit bigger so that you can see it with mathematicians. We've got 55 hundredths, right, over here. And we're going to multiply that by 3 tenths because we have that right here, right? Now that is going to equal 55 times 3. Huh, what would that be? Well, 3 times 5 is 15. 3 times 50 is 150, right? So here, when I combine those values, we're going to have 165. If you can follow that 55 times 3 in your head, it's great. Otherwise, feel free to come to the side and do a little scrap work. But sure enough, you should get to that answer. Now, 100 times 10 is like a 100 with an extra zero. It's a thousand. 165 over 1,000. Now, we're going to go to our next problem, okay? So here, boys and girls, we have 91 hundredths times 9 tenths. Once again, I'm going to draw a little line here. I'm going to write this out over here. Once again, hopefully for your benefit, just because I want you to be able to read this clearly. We have 91 over 100. That's what this means. We're going to multiply that by 9 over 10. Okay. Then what we can do is remind ourselves that really our numerator is going to be 91 times 9 over 100 times 10. All I've done is combine my numerators in a multiplication expression, and I've combined my denominators in a multiplication expression. Now, pause and think, what is 91 times 9? That's going to equal 819, and my new denominator will be 1,000. What a problem to end with. That finishes up week 27.